Hello and welcome back to Ozpol Explained. I'm your wonderfully handsomely bearded host, David, and today we're going to be answering the question of why does Queensland only have one house in its parliament? You know? You're probably wondering, why does this matter, David? And I will explain to you right now. Thank you for listening. Okay, so federally, and for almost every single state, our system of government involves two chambers, or houses. You've probably heard of the Senate and the House of Representatives for the federal government, and the Legislative Assembly and Legislative Council for states. The Legislative Assembly is the lower house, and the Legislative Council is the upper house. Some states call it the House of Assembly, but that's not important. So take that, South Australia. This video is not about you. Anyway, the only exceptions to this are the Northern Territory and the ACT, which only have the Legislative Assembly because they're territories. And also, for some weird reason, Queensland. You may have heard me bring this up in multiple videos, but never explained why? So let's explore that question. Why is Queensland so different in this particular instance? We don't have to touch on why Queensland is different in, a, in, the, in every way. So first off, what is a legislative council and assembly? Governments all around the world usually have things called houses or chambers. The names of them differ, but the function of them is that politicians get together in them and then they introduce and discuss laws. If you have two chambers, this can lead to a lot of debate and compromise, and also introduce a lot of amendments to bills because sometimes it requires multiple parties to agree to get a law made. In Australia, the states have two chambers. A bill needs to pass in both of them to become law. But if you only have one chamber, then there's no what we call a chamber of review. So, if the Queensland government has a majority in the Legislative Assembly, then it can pass whatever laws it needs to without needing to compromise. Uh, if they have a minority government, they do have to compromise. The two chambers, by the way, is not a, a universal thing. Like New Zealand, for instance, only has one chamber. Queensland's government began in 1860 with two houses the Legislative Assembly, and the Legislative Council. That sounds like what we have today in most states, but there was one key difference. And I'm talking like really big difference to how it works today. See, the Assembly right was made up of elected politicians, and that's where the government sat. If you had a majority in the Assembly, you were pretty much the government. The Council, on the other hand, was made up of people appointed by the governor. And these appointments were for life. Now, that sounds very undemocratic. And it super is. That's not, that's, it's the opposite to be, it's the opposite of democracy, really. This isn't without precedent, because you see, England, Australia's daddy, has two houses. They still have two houses that work like this. The House of Commons where members are elected, you know, like democracy, and the House of Lords, where they're not. People in the House of Lords literally inherit their seat. They are referred to as hereditary peers. Weird. And the thing is, they've legislated to change, like, how many seats there can be, how many hereditary peers there are. There's so, like, that was recent. The government has the power to change it, but they were like, oh, let's keep it though. This whole thing where there's a whole chamber of people and they're not elected and they're just there for life. <laughs> Let's just keep that. In the year, in the, in the 21st century, as a lot of Australia's political system is based off England, Queensland had taken on the idea of appointing people to a chamber instead of electing them. That being said, it wasn't without contemporary criticism. The Morton Bay Courier said, it is a contemptible instrument of bad government and causes much unnecessary expense. Let the upper house be done away with and the number of members in the lower house be increased. Some people already wanted the legislative council to be abolished well before it was. Fast forward to 1915 and we reach the beginning of the end of the legislative council. Labour came to power under the leadership of T.J. Ryan, who was 
still a fan, not a big fan at all of the Legislative Council. Labour believed that it was undemocratic, probably because it was, and it should be abolished. Probably because it should have been. Not to get like too political, but like... I like democracy. And, you know, the dislike was apparently mutual because the council believed that Labour was also bad and shouldn't be in government. The council aggressively rejected or heavily amended around 800 bills between 1915 and 1919. That obviously sounds like a lot, but when we put that into perspective, the previous government under Digby Denham from 1911 to 1914, had one bill rejected. And now we've put it in perspective, you know that it is actually a lot. It's a lot. So there was just this big conservative block of politicians whose terms just won't expire except by special appointment from the Grim Reaper. And it was trying to stop Labour from being able to govern. They were like, ah, oh, I don't like that you got elected by the majority of people. Stop. So here's where it all starts to get interesting. Ryan was like, hey, let's just write up a bill that abolishes the Legislative Council. Sick idea, right? No. Because even though, like, the Assembly goes, yeah, of course, the Council should be abolished. And they're like, oh, of course, there's a majority of Labour people here. More than half of us say, like, go away, Legislative Council. The problem is, the bill still has to pass in the council. So Ryan passes the bill to them and goes, hey, do you want to die? <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan passes the bill to them and he's like, here you go. And then the council looks at it and goes, no. We're not voting to have ourselves fired. Who would do that? Foreshadowing. You know what Ryan's amazing plan was? to just do it again. And amazingly, it didn't work. Yeah, it turns out, you know, you can't just go up to someone and be like, pretty please, can you just quit? And they go, no. And you're like, but please, but please, please just quit. Just please just quit. Okay, I'll be like, I'll be like your best friend. I'll share like my lunch with you. And they're like, no. This is my cushy job, I have it for life. What, and also I don't like you. I super don't like you and I want to ruin your life. And this is the best way for me to do that. Legislative council is a bully, okay? Say no to bully. <laughs> so he's failed twice. So he's realized, you know, hey, maybe we should try a different tactic, right? So the idea was, we'll just go to a referendum in 1917, which unfortunately, was also held at the same time as a federal election. And so people were, you know, kind of distracted and mostly focused on that instead. There was this thing called World War One also happening, which really just took people's attentions away from such pitiful things like, should we abolish half the government? Like, uh, you know. And so like most referendums, it just came back, no. So Ryan went, oh yeah, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, no, I get you. Yeah, and I, no, no, I'm kidding. What he did was what he always tries to do. And he just tried to legislate the council out of existence two more times. Again, in 1918 and in 1919, he wrote another bill and he was like, here you go. And the council was like, you realize that we have to pass this, right? Like we all have to, we have to agree on that and it's not gonna happen. You get that, right? Do you, you get, do you, you, you get this, you get how this works though, TJ Ryan, right? Like you keep sending us these notes that go, please let me fire you. And we still don't wanna quit because we still don't like you. So like, no, just no. And also no to your most recent like hundred bills that you've tried to pass as well. We don't like those either. I don't understand what your problem is, TJ Ryan. So then Ryan just wrote another bill and he's like, here you go. And the council wrote back being like, are you, are you listening though? Cause are you paying attention to anything we're trying to tell you here? Cause it doesn't seem to be getting through your head. We don't want to leave. And you know the saying, if at first you don't succeed, then that just proves that democracy is deeply broken and you just need to keep trying. But don't worry, there is a solution. The governor, Sir Hamilton Gould Adams, 
decided to appoint 13 Labour members to the council in 1918 and then three more in 1919 and yet still with 16 more Labour members in the council the bill to abolish it still could not pass. So what does Gould Adams do? Stop trying. He just refuses to appoint any more Labour people to the council even though like he could have done some pretty basic maths. Labour needs at least half the numbers and so if you add like if they need 10 and you add 5 and then you're like there you go. Labour is like we need more numbers. Can you add them? And he's like no. And then in 1919 TJ Ryan quits. He's like I'm done. My largest goal is left unfinished. I am going to federal politics instead. And so he was then replaced by Ted Theodore, also a Labour man, as Premier. And you know what Ted Theodore does? The same thing, only this time he does it better. Gould Adams was retiring in early 1920 so the Speaker of the Assembly, William Lennon, was made Lieutenant Governor. He then appointed 14 more Labour members to the council and they were called the Suicide Squad. That's not a joke, they really were. See, Lennon knows how to do maths. Long before DC Comics made one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life and even long before the comic book series was created there was a bunch of Labour politicians ready to blow up a house metaphorically speaking. The chamber is still physically there, by the way, it still exists. Theodore had won the 1920 election and remarkably both the national and country parties were in favour to changes to the council. I suppose they could have done what other states did and made the council full of elected representatives instead of just hand-picked, but they didn't. It was too late for the council, they'd had their time, they've demonstrated how annoying they were, it was time for them to go down. 24th of October 1921, the end is nigh. Theodore introduced the Constitution Act Amendment Bill. It passed with a large majority, with even most of the opposition voting for it in the Legislative Assembly. It was introduced to the council by A.J. Jones, who was introducing a bill to abolish the council for the third time in his political career. And finally, it passed. There was dancing in the street, maybe. I wasn't there. You can't prove it. You don't know where I was. Look, I'm pretty sure someone out there was super happy about this. Probably T.J. Ryan, who was like, Yes, it happened. I knew it. Finally! Because of our ties to Britain, there was the possibility of the king coming in and interfering. But the British Secretary of State and for the colonies at the time was some dude called the Winston Churchill, whoever that is, and he commented that it was not the place of the king to intervene and assent should be given to the bill. 3rd of March 1922, the bill was given royal assent and proclaimed on the 23rd. After several decades and years of fighting, multiple premiers, the council was dead. There have been talks about recreating the council. Arthur Moore, who would become the conservative premier in 1929, held reintroducing the council as a key election promise. But then like this really inconvenient thing called the Great Depression happened and so he kind of abandoned that idea. In 1934, Labour Premier William Forgan Smith made an amendment that the council couldn't be reintroduced without a referendum, which is kind of like digging up someone's grave and then putting extra nails in the coffin. In 2006, former federal Labour leader and then Governor General Bill Hayden said that he hoped for the reintroduction of a second chamber. There have been calls from minor parties to re-establish it as well with both the right-wing Family First Party, which no longer exists, and the left-wing party, the Greens, wanting a chamber of review. However, as of this video, there are no current plans to do so. Maybe one day it will be back. And when it does return, it is pretty certainly going to be with actually elected members as it should be. In the meantime, the old chamber still exists 
but is used for ceremonial and formal occasions. The original furniture from the 1870s is still in there. It is just now a fascinating bit of Australian political history. Thank you so much for watching. I'm so glad to finally answer this question. I hope you enjoyed this. Comment down below what you would love to learn about next. Please message this video to someone that you know who lives in Queensland. Maybe they'll enjoy it. You can also support me on Patreon, link in the description. You can now give me $3,000 per video if you happen to be a millionaire or if you know a millionaire, or if you're like me and not a millionaire, you can support me for just $1 per video. What good deal compared to the $3,000 option. Why did you make that, David? Shh. Uh, I thought it would be funny and hey, <laughs> if it works. Anyway, also there is a copy of the script in the description where you can see all the citations I used to make this video so you can read more about it or use it in assignments. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.